Sometimes we are already having struggles and something else comes. That's what we talked about last week. That's not abnormal. So we're going to read the story again. On the second page here, It's if you're looking at the top and it says continued, it should be page six, and you're going continued. It's continued from last week because we're still on the life of a dead boy. Okay, life for a dead boy. So I'm going to read the story again as we continue through it. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in, is true, in your mouth is truth. So this is a powerful story. As far as we know, there would have never, Elijah hasn't done anything with regard to a miracle. As far as we know, the first thing that was when he burst on the scene at the beginning of this chapter and said, it's not going to rain until I say it doesn't, and he ran. The first miracle we know happened because it was that he was fed by the ravens, but that were because of him speaking a word was the oil and the meal never running dry, never running out. And now he probably prayed three times and cried out because if you're trying to raise the dead, aren't you pretty desperate? If you have you ever done that? He's had, as far as we know, no other miracles at his hand as he's prayed. And here he's got like the hardest one first. Raising the dead. Couldn't I just heal a hangnail? <laughs> Ask that, you know. No, raising the dead. So here's the interesting thing. The widow's reaction to her son's death is guilt. Her reaction was guilt. She says, have you come to bring my sin to remembrance? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance. We often associate our problems with our failures. Something bad happens, we think, what did I do to cause this? Don't we? We're, she's not odd. She's like we are. We're like, I thought I hadn't done anything. Why is this happening to me? We ask that a lot. Why is this happening to me? And sometimes even as we give our requests, it's like the person I'm giving this request for, they don't deserve this. Why is it happening? That's a common question. Perhaps she had thought that she was taking care of this prophet of God. He would keep her from the consequences of her sin. She'd have a little like safety net or a, a extra protection because after all, are canceling out her sin. And so when this happens, she says, now I remember my sin is cause is that what caused this? Is that why you came? To kill my son so I'd remember my sin? That's her response. Interestingly, Elijah's response, a reaction to the boy's pest, pest, <laughs> death, and I'm sorry it's a big word, but it was incru, incredulity, incredulity, incredulity. It's incredulous. He's incredulous. He can't believe God would do this. That's his. It isn't about his own sin. It's like, she's helping me. Incredulity. I-N-C-R-E-D-U-L-I-T-Y. Incredulity. Unbelief. It isn't, it, I didn't want to put unbelief. I actually had unbelief there. 
It isn't unbelief that God can't heal, or that God couldn't restore, or that God isn't God. It isn't that kind of unbelief. That's why I didn't want to put that word, because we tend to associate that with not trusting God. This was a different kind of unbelief. It was like, are you kidding me? She's taking care of me. She's the provision. She's helping me. She's given me this room to stay in, and you kill her son? That's his response. The fact that they're both shocked indicates, of course, that it, like we said last week, he was truly dead. Have you brought calamity by killing her son? We often also associate blessings with our good works, don't we? Just like we associate bad things that come with our failures, we associate good things with what we did, like we earned it. Both sides, don't we? Perhaps she, he thought the widow's help should protect her. She's helping me. She's spending herself on me, on taking care of me. Certainly, God will keep other calamity from her. But he didn't. And like I said, I don't think either one of these are odd. Because we do the same thing. We associate our blessings with our behavior, our attitude, our good deeds. And we associate anything bad that comes with something we failed. So I want to talk a minute about that and remind us the good or bad that happens to us is not always, I'm going to say always because I'm going to show you a couple of examples in the Bible, the good or bad that happens to us is not always a consequence of sin or a reward for good works. The truth is, bad things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people. It's part of life. And we need to learn to just look to the Lord and call out to him and say, I don't know what's going on, but I know you are trustworthy. Let me tell you two times. Jesus um, healed this in John 5. He healed a man and the man didn't went on his way and then he Jesus saw him later and the man recognized him as the one who healed him and in John 5 14 Jesus found him in the temple and said to him the man he had healed so the man had been ill the man had been sick he said see you are well sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you see it was a sin that caused it he said it right there sometimes I think that's true. It may have been true in the life of this man. It may not have. He may have just been sinning, saying, don't sin. Don't keep sinning. Anything could happen to you. Okay? He thought that was bad. It could be worse. Like the person who was feeling so bad and someone said, cheer up, things could be worse. So he cheered up and sure enough, things got worse. Yeah. But another time, as they passed by, he saw a blind man, a man blind from birth, John 9, just four chapters later. And his disciples asked him, because they were doing exactly what we tend to do. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So the apostles, the disciples, are associating the blindness with sin. We can tend to do that. Do you ever have a youth outing all planned for a picnic and it rained? And you stand around now. We had this plan for a month and now it's raining. Who sinned? <laughs> we just tend to do that. We have a cause and effect attitude. And so the disciples asked, who sinned, this man or his parents? Somebody's, so he's paying for somebody's sin. And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. God had another purpose 
Maybe this purpose does sound like what God did with the widow's son. Because God is getting glory even to this day for that healing. So that would be perhaps the reason he died. So I think it's important we keep that in mind. Now another thing that we can tend to do is look at cause and effect by what Elijah did. Elijah stretches himself on the dead boy. This same way happened other times in scripture with Elijah or Elisha too, where they do that and, and, and uh, with Dorcas um, or Tabitha in the book of Acts. Is that, oh, is that supposed to be the method then? Is that the way to pray for people to be healed or raised from the dead? Stretcher, that's the thing. We don't know why he did that. We don't find a biblical teaching on doing that. We are told to pray for the sick by doing what? Laying hands and anointing with oil. That is a biblical premise. It also doesn't indicate you always have to do that or no healing. It doesn't teach that, but it doesn't teach this, and yet it worked. What happened? Why? I have a quote here from someone named Tim Keller, and it just was well written, well stated, what, what I think we need to remember. No one, no one can from our vantage point and no one can know many times after years and years and years of going through it, what in the world God is up to. Amen. So guess what? We're going to have to trust him. It's illogical to think we can figure it out or we can see it. It's, we're never, from our vantage point, we just can't get it sometimes, what God is doing, what he was doing in the Bible. We just, our vantage point doesn't show us. And even if, now it doesn't. And then he says, even if many, many years, we continue years and years to go through it. You ever have that? You ever do that about something? Something years ago, but now at different times it comes back to your minds and you review it and you think about it. How did that happen? I don't understand what was going on there or I don't even know what God was doing and I'm this far after it. So this man says, we can't figure out all the time what God, what in the world God is up to. We're just going to have to trust him. And then I have a quote by another person. I'm going to tell you who the person is after I read the quote. We need to decide. Trust God or see if maybe the doctors have a better idea. I say, trust God. We know him better. Amen. Pastor Dad Carlson said that. He sent it to us in the form of a text when we were near the end of his time in the hospital and he was trying to get home. And he, I think the doctors were saying it wouldn't necessarily go well any better if he went home. And he thought, he just wanted to get home. And he said, I think we need to trust God. The doctors may think they have a better idea, but we know God better. Let's trust him. So be encouraged. Trust God. You may never understand. But the easiest, the best way to learn to trust him is to know him. The better we know him, the more we can trust him. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it seems like. I'm going to read 1 John 3, 19 to 20. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Be very careful, remember, of following your heart. Except as God directs. Because the heart above all things is desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says. We don't, the world may say, oh, just follow your heart. No, don't. The human heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Deceitful, that's the word. The, 
heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We have to trust God. Even if our hearts feels different and our heart condemns us, maybe for past sin, like this woman. God is greater than our heart. If we've asked forgiveness, he says we're forgiven. We trust him, not the doctors, not us more, most importantly. This is a song. Some of you remember it. Dodie's, Brian and Paula Dodie used to sing it as a duet. And I'm just going to sing the chorus. It's a wonderful song. It goes simply like this. It's a good reminder. God is too wise to be mistaken, whatever you're going through. Remember, God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart. He alone is faithful and true. He alone knows what is best for you. Those two things, he's too wise to be mistaken. And he's too good to be unkind. So even if you can't tell it's him, even if you can't see his hand in it, Trust his heart. Trust his heart. The result of this miracle for the woman, for the widow, is that she, and we have three things, she recognized that Elijah was a man of God. Man of God is the blank there. She recognized that Elijah was a man of God. Notice she said after she received her son, now I know that you are a man of God. You have eaten oil, used oil and meal that never ran out. That didn't convince her. She had to have a horse in the race. She had to have skin in the game, right? She had to have something that mattered, and what really mattered was her son. Even feeding him wasn't as important as him dying and getting him back. She also declared that Elijah spoke the word of the Lord. She recognized that Elijah was a man of God. She declared that Elijah spoke the word of the Lord. Now, can you imagine her going back? Oh, everything he says, I got to remember it now. I got to remember. I got a quick story. I know it's late, but if you like stories, because I tell you, you like them. Um, these two friends of ours were traveling, singing evangelists, and they met these, they were single men young men, and they met these two single Norwegian girls in one of the towns they visited. And they were there for a week of meetings, probably Minnesota, you know. And while they were visiting, they went out with these two girls, their sisters, and the girls spoke Norwegian. What they didn't know is so did the guys. <laughs> and so they would be out talking about the guys during the week. And the guys never let on that they knew how to speak Norwegian and they knew what the girls were saying. Until the last day, they joined in the conversation in Norwegian. Now here's where this fits in. So the woman's trying to go, well, the, his words are the word of God. What did he say? And they were going, what did we say all week? <laughs> trying to remember. So they wanted to, they, she wanted to remember now I know his words are the words of God. I want to remember what they are. You know, I think it's a good reason to fill out your notes on Sunday and write down extra things if they mean something to you. Ask Yvonne, she probably has the whole page full of notes. <laughs> she takes a lot of notes because those are the words of God. And you may go home and go, he said something. What was it? What was it? I want to remember it's the word of God. And thirdly, she believed not only that they were the words of God, but she believed that Elijah's words were true. She added that. And now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. It's not just the word of the Lord, but it's true. Duh. But she knew it. And that's why she, what happened what changed about Elijah? The result is of this miracle for Elijah is that first he proved he was faithful to do simple things 
before few people in small places. Only one person saw this miracle. As far as we know, there was one witness to this miracle. The woman. We don't even know if the kid knew he was dead. Let me give you the blank. It's faithful. Elijah here proved even if it was a simple thing with no audience, he would be faithful. Even if it was a brand new thing he'd never prayed about before, that it was raising the dead. He was faithful to do it before few people in small places, an obscure village outside of Israel. And he then would become better prepared because he was faithful in the small things in small places. He would be better prepared, better prepared for chapter 18. <laughs> Did I put that? He would become better prepared to do great things before many people in bigger places. He's going to have a showdown with hundreds of prophets of Baal on a mountaintop with the whole nation witnessing it very soon. His faithfulness in small places for a few people doing small things like raising the dead would prepare him for doing great things, bringing fire from heaven in front of many people in bigger places, public eye, in front of the whole nation that would decide whether or not God was the true God. When we are, caref when we are careful to obey God in small things, when we are careful to obey God in small things, he can entrust us, entrust is your word, he can entrust us with more opportunities to prove ourselves faithful. When we are careful to obey God in small things, don't write them off. Don't say, oh, that's no big deal. Oh, I heard that message and I, I see this small thing in my life I should probably change, but oh, it's just a small thing. That's how we get God. We move to the place where God can entrust us to give us more opportunities to be faithful to him in bigger things, to prove ourselves faithful. Luke 16, 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. That isn't because, oh, people who start stealing young and little things, they'll end up stealing. We don't just make that up by experience or case study. It says it right here in scripture. Those small things tell. They tell about what's really in our hearts. One more song. I don't know if you know this song. It's called Find Us Faithful. You see, we want to be faithful so God will entrust us, entrust us with more. But we also want to be faithful for those who come behind us and hear our stories and look at our lives. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. We want to be found faithful. They're your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews. They will know and look back at your life. Will they find you faithful? Will your life inspire them to obey God? Will the footprints you leave, let, lead, if they say, I'm going to be just like them, will it lead them to believe and trust God? We need to be faithful so those who come behind us follow God. Leave the right footprints. Live a life that inspires obedience to God. Be found faithful by those who come behind. Lord, let that be our prayer today. 
that all who come behind us, all who hear our stories, all who hear about our lives or see our lives even today, find us faithful. May our lives, the obedience, the way we talk about you, the way we live for you, inspire them to do the same. May the footprints, if they follow us, always lead to trusting and believing you. Thank you, Lord, for this story. Thank you for this miracle that brings you glory. Help us to reflect on it and bring you glory in all we do, whether it's raising the dead, small things, big things. Let you be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.